this workshop is called to order. As I don't have my agenda, I am assuming we're uh, going to do the pledge. Yes, sir. Director Evans, would you mind leaving us? My pleasure. I pledge, pledge allegiance, allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Roll call. Here. President Evans? Here. Present. Here. Here. Any public speaking? Well, he knows because of the early start, we have the public here. Thank God we should have had this at 1 o'clock. 6 o'clock. I'm sorry? Oh, we moved to adopt. Move, move to adopt. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you, Ann. Moving on to item number one. All right, tonight you're going to hear a presentation on the status of the uh, water and wastewater master plan. So Mr. Scholl will be walking us through that, and we have a cast of supporting Look at engineers that, characters. To help them out. And we mean characters. <laughs> I, I have one question for you oh, yeah. so early on is, are we going to have water? I heard we weren't going to have water. You heard we're not going to have water. Some report had it. Well, no, I heard we had that result by the Supreme Court, was it? Somebody Plenty of water. Oh, plenty, plenty of water. Of water. Oh, okay. plenty of water. I heard we would That's right. Water. That's why uh, Mike didn't show up. Oh. Northern California situation there? No, San, San Marcos. Our, our, San Marcos situation. Our, our, there was a report that went out that said we wouldn't be able to serve water. Gotcha. Okay. Okay. Well, good afternoon, President Hernandez, members of the board. Uh, presented to you here that this is kind of the take two here on the 2017 Master Plans Capital Improvement Program. Uh, you've seen a similar presentation back in September of 2016, and just to kind of get the general manager and legal counsel a little bit up to speed too. We had a similar presentation on the CIP. The board had some concerns on it there. Um, we had approximately a $315 million CIP. Uh, we've uh, taken a look at it. We've, we've revised the CIP a little bit here. Uh, and there's some good reasons for that too. Uh, one of those reasons being uh, we have a better handle on some of the land uses, especially in the specific planning areas of the, that the city had. Uh, found the initial assumptions used were a little conservative here, so we backed off a little bit on that there, make them more reasonable. Uh, the build-out date here, uh, originally we had a, a 2050 uh, presumed build-out date there. We got away from that, we got away from that whole methodology and revised that for uh, doing growth. Instead, now we're using a SANDAG five-year to five-year projection. And that's allowed us to defer projects here because of the reduced growth here. So uh, we've pushed a lot of those back, especially on the water side. And one other thing here I wanted to... Oh, Thank you. By all means. Uh, just when you said we changed it, when we changed it, what did we change it? Just briefly, why, I know why, but how did we change it? How, why weren't we connected before, I guess, with Sandbag, and what did we do differently? So ultimate, uh, or initially there, we used an ultimate date of 2050 here, and what happened is we assumed that was our ultimate build out, and then kind of backed in between now and 2050, and then it was kind of a straight line, this is your growth. That turned out to be way too much growth, way too quickly. So now, well, build out is somewhere, some theoretical date could be 100 years from now, could be 200 years from now, somewhere in the future. The, that's the ultimate. Correct. And so it's kind of a dateless time, in other words. And instead, like I said, we're using the SANDAG growth estimates, and they give us those every five years through 2035. And they say, this is how much your population is growing, this is how much your different uh, commercial, residential, everything else is projected to grow. We're using that number instead. And that's why it allows us to defer CIPs. Correct, because that has substantially reduced the growth estimate yes. that we initially had okay. back in 2016. Thank you. A couple of questions, Director Martin. First question, <coughs> General Manager, actually. Would it be possible for us to get a hard copy of it during this meeting? I know we received it electronically. Uh, but I'd like a hard copy to go through it. Of this? Of the, of the presentation. Oh, yeah, of the, of the PowerPoint? Yeah. 
Okay. I mean, can we get a hard copy today yeah, you to follow along? If you can. I know Thank I am busy, but is there someone else that can push the copy machine number? Well, and, and we'll just ask somebody else to do it, and she'll be right back. And yeah. let's find out how many others may, would like a hard copy. Yeah, okay. uh, if we're going to go, two, I made mine. You did. You're, you're yeah. a fine person. Uh, Director, would you like a hard copy? Yeah. Sure. Oh, yes. Get us all hard copies. Mm -hmm. Thank, you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. Uh, Director Sinella, yes. So I, get, I, I like that you guys have kind of switched your methodology uh, from kind of more of a estimated what it's going to look like at full build out um, to something that where you're looking at kind of more actual, more timely data every five years mm -hmm. that gets updated on a, on a regular basis. So um, I think that's a good approach. Would you agree that, that that's a more accurate way to do it, kind of more accurate way to kind of estimate your needs? Absolutely. Uh, this is going to be a lot more realistic here to what you're going to see for actual growth. I, 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 I do have a question. I have heard in the past that even though this may be more accurate, uh, Sandag's uh, documents and their uh, projections are just not realistic. And I don't know if, if how did you say that to me? No. Oh, okay. Well, I'm going to blame you. Um, <laughs> so Hal doesn't believe it. And no, the, I so I'm wondering, <laughs> he doesn't believe anything. Um, and I'm wondering, are we confident that there is not yet another way for our projections to be assumed for our capital improvements? Well, Sandag updates their methodology every three to five years. They come out with what's called a new series. We're using what's called series 12. They've already released a series 13 uh, between the time that we started this process and, and now. And sometime in the near future here, probably in the next two years, they'll release a 2014. And so they, every time they do this here, they do revise their numbers a lot here. And, and that's really based on what they've seen in the past. And since the growth has really, really, you know, trimmed back since the boom days here, uh, the numbers, especially from Series 11 to Series 12, have substantially come down as far as the growth rate. And I suspect in 13 and 14, they'll continue to do the same as well. Okay. Yes. Just one other follow-up question. I know we're kind of asking a lot of questions mm -hmm. before you started, sure. so I apologize. But um, is uh, do other water districts? Uh, project this way as well and how about other um, uh, like you know, school districts and cities and other entities I, I can't speak for school districts I can definitely speak for other water districts uh, there are three major methodologies that can be utilized by water districts and a lot of it depends on uh, if you're still a growth agency or not so for instance Valacitos is a growth agency one of the few still left in the county uh, or uh, worked at OTI before, they were a growth agency, so they used this type of growth method. There's also another method for agencies that don't have a lot of growth there, a different methodology which basically uses uh, the value of their existing infrastructure as the basis for their capital facility fees. That, that's kind of jumping to a different topic. But, and then there's a hybrid method that can also be used that kind of combines the growth and the conservative method. Uh, one of our staff has. So, uh, just to kind of follow up on what Rob said, <coughs> uh, you may remember also uh, the general manager for CWA, Maureen Stapleton, giving a presentation about their growth projections on their, on their planning studies. And San Diego County Water Authority actually has a contract with Sandag to only use the Sandag data. Not all agencies, there's Sandag data and there's a Department of Finance has growth projection data also. Uh, but those are primary, the two primary methods of how growth is forecasted. But SANDAG uh, is the regional of San Diego. You see the, the CWA has a contract to use their data. And mo not all, but most agencies follow suit for their master plan data. But I know the Department of Finance is another one that is sometimes cross track <coughs> Thank you both. Very good. Thank you. All right. And one more thing to note before I get started on this presentation, too, I want to let the board know that uh, we did meet with the Building <coughs> Industry Association uh, back in late February, uh, and they've seen the presentation very similar to this one here. Uh, we've made a few modifications and revisions since then to update the numbers. Uh, but we also wanted to let the board know that 
they they haven't given us any specific comment to date there either formally or informally okay so with that here I'll kind of get started so these are the objectives here we're, we're looking to get through tonight uh, I'm just going to do a brief review of the master plan purpose and goals here then we'll quickly talk about the duty factors demand projections and design criteria and how all of those wrap up into the water and wastewater capital improvement programs and then we'll talk real quick here about the CIP cost estimates, uh, how we obtain those, what they are here at the moment, and we'll actually compare those to the 2016 presentation as well, so you can kind of look at those two side by side. And then I'll wrap up here by just talking about the schedule here for the master plan and program EIR adoption. So real quick here on the master plan purpose and goals here. So this is our tool. This is our planning tool here for anticipating growth within the district. We're going to analyze our approved land use data here to come up with both water and wastewater demands. And with these demands here, we're going to identify capital improvement projects to accommodate the demands. So these would be reservoirs, pump stations, lift stations, pipelines, etc. Uh, we also have a water resource and supply component there to the master plan. So th this isn't looking at like what an urban water management plan does. This isn't going to say, do we have enough supply? This is just going to look at supply alternatives that are available, some that we've already implemented, such as desal, and some that are still potentially on the table. So once again here, goal of the master plan, we're trying to accommodate plan development within the district. Uh, we're going to identify all, all potential infrastructure problems between now and ultimate build out. We're going to come up with a capital facility program to uh, remedy that there. And then we'll also get into the fees uh, and the uh, costs that are associated with those projects. I have one quick question. question? Thank you. I just want you to clarify uh, one more time for me um, how the master plan in considering the water resource and supply alternatives is different than an urban management plan. Okay, so in the master plan, we're going to have a chapter. It's chapter four. It's just going to talk about water supply alternatives that are out there. Uh, very similar to what you see in an integrated resources plan. In other words, what potential supplies are out there, uh, which include desal, which we've done before, which include other agency connections, which we've also done, uh, it includes groundwater, uh, potential conservation measures, for instance. It's just going to identify what we've done, what's out there, what would be the potential benefits for some of these supplies, such as you know a drought benefit for desal is a good one. Mm -hmm. uh, having redundant supplies here is another one. So it's, it's just really going to look at that. The urban water management plan that is a state mandated document that we do every five years, that's going to look at do we have enough supply? Are we projected to have enough supply in the future? It's meant to answer those questions, if that makes sense. So one is looking at the possibility of where we could get the supply. And the second one is actually analyzing if the supply is there to meet our demands. There, there you go. That's okay. a great way of putting it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Get that right. Okay, so for the land use here, we, uh, I know James was just talking about uh, CWA and their contract to use SANDAC for everything. We actually obtained the land use data <clears throat> directly from the land use agencies. So the four cities that we have within our jurisdiction as well as the county of San Diego. And what we do with the SANDAG is we use the SANDAG data, especially their existing population uh, estimates there, to project between now and the next 20 years. That's about, I think their information only goes out for 20 or 25 years. It doesn't go out to ultimate here. But basically, we use the SANDAG data to fill in the gaps here. And so duty factors, which are water and wastewater usage factors uh, on a daily basis there per an acre of property. So what we do to come up with these here is we, we, we use a, a variety of tools 
to generate our duty factors uh, for our different types of uh, land uses. We use our water meter records uh, from 2008 to 2014. We use our wastewater meters. Uh, we have approximately 15 or so of them in our system. We compare the two because you don't want to have a situation where you've got more wastewater than you've got water used, even though during a huge rainstorm you potentially could have that scenario. Uh, and then we also compare the duty factors to what we've used in previous master plans as well for consistency. Yes, sir. Is the duty factor what we, our capital, we, we believe our capital expenditure, it will be um, being divided by what we believe the growth is going to be? So if we're going to spend $100,000 and we think the growth is going to be a hundred, then you divide one to the other and that's the duty factor? Duty factor is actually based on actual historical usage. So we know from our water meters, for instance, how much water that different types, and I'll go to the next slide, that'll help explain the situation. Let me jump in real quick. I think what you're referring to is the capital facility fee, which would be the dollars you spend divided by the number of units that will pay for that. The duty factor talks about how much uh, either water or wastewater a typical customer uses. It's how we apportion demand to, to customers. And, and Rob will okay. further explain that. No, that's, that's perfect, actually. Because uh, you'll see here, uh, depending on residential density here, we've got a lot of different categories for that. Uh, commercial, industrial. <clears throat> and this is a comparison with previous master plans. And the key here is consistency. We, we try not to make large deviations if possible. Uh, one thing there that we haven't had a lot of data in the past, though, has been the high density residential. So you see that's still kind of a moving target for us. We're, we're still trying to adjust and we're still trying to achieve the, the right number for this here. And as we get more uh, of this high density development in the district, we're getting better data for this too. So we're able to get uh, a better estimate on that. Yes. It's kind of a basic question, mm -hmm. but um, on figuring out the duty factors and we're going to average the waste and, and water demands, over time, have we changed any of the definitions of our land use categories? I mean, we've added some that we didn't use before, like you were just saying, the high um, density, but have we changed any of those categories? That, as a definition? The only, in, as a way? definition, the only one that we have changed is the very low density residential, which is those less than one acre. We used to actually have two different very low density residential categories for that there. And we've actually combined those into one, and which is everything less than one acre. Uh, per dwelling unit. Is the, you're talking about the first two on this chart? I'm talking about the very top one on this oh, chart. Oh, the one DU per acre. That, that's correct there, less, less than one dwelling unit per acre. Used to be two different categories. One was like super low residential, which went to like uh, an eighth of an acre or eighth of a dwelling unit per acre. So it was like big, big loss there. Okay. That just could combine with another low density one. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if all of these oh. are. Co a, a, Comparisons are all the same. Yes, yes, we try to do that. Okay. Hey, Robin, I seem to recall we might have talked about this before in the past, but maybe you can refresh my memory. Uh, on the bottom here, open space, and you're you're uh, projecting 200 gallons per day per acre. Um, and when I think of open space, I'm thinking of just the hillside of shrubs with no water infrastructure whatsoever, no no irrigation. How do we come? And how and why do we come up with the 200? Okay, great question. So open space here, uh, a lot of this is dedicated open space. A lot of this is dedicated easements. Uh, for instance, the Center of Natural Lands Management is a big firm that actually maintains a lot of this open space. They actually use water. Yeah, okay. we, we, we've got you so know, they, tens they, of thousands. So they have pipes out there? And Correct, yeah. because they have different mitigation projects uh, that they're always doing here. So they'll, they'll do, for instance, a five, your mitigation project here, and after success, they'll move on to another area that they also control and try another mitigation project. So there actually is a lot of water usage on these types of properties. Okay. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
how do you differentiate between those which are under a management and those which are not, which are using zero water? So the short answer is we don't. The short answer is anything here that's open space goes into this category here. We don't have, it, you're kind of thinking of like a, a vacant land, something to that effect here. Yeah, for instance, the last project that we approved the water usage on, uh, out of the end of Las Posas, the Highlands, mm -hmm. where 75% of that is staying open space. Now my understanding is that open space is not to be touched by anybody's water, except for God's. Uh, how, do you, how do you justify it? It's actually, I'm, I'm going to say here that there's a very high likelihood here because that's going to get turned to a <coughs> conservation agency. I believe here because that's going to be dedicated open space here so there's a good chance here that someone would start a water project for instance on that property here it would make sense then to put that under this open space where it actually has a water use to it because there's a potential that they're going to actually put some type of um, project out there that's going to require water yes change we actually carved out the open space areas and gave them an annex. So that's, that, that really didn't apply to the Highlands project for us. Their sloped irrigation, which is going to be part of their open space, has to get revegetated and replanted. So that is definitely going to use probably more than 200 gallons per acre because it's a concentrated area. So if, if we uh, don't annex it, then we don't charge. Yes. So in the Highlands issue, issue where we did not annex that larger piece, there's no charge for that. No dwelling unit equivalent. Yeah, absolutely. There was, yeah. there was, there wasn't considered when we analyzed yeah. the water use. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, that make, does make sense. Okay. And, and just for that particular example of the Highlands too, that area that didn't get annexed is not going to be considered in this master plan because it's not going to be in our district. Exactly. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Well, let me ask you a curiosity. Uh, the San Alejo Ridge Line mm -hmm. down to the Discovery Hills Line that half that side of that, that mountain. Right. We, we don't put water on there, do we? We don't put water on there. There is a park station with the restroom. There's also the Center of Natural Lands Management does control a lot, of, a lot of that down the hill too, where they do use water and they do have some mitigation projects. So basically, this comes out to an average. If we take all the projected open space here, uh, that's being watered, that, that hasn't been watered, average it all out, it comes to about this 200 gallons per acre number. And, and are these conservation districts, uh, are they water metered? Oh, that's absolutely, yes. Now, a lot of them have been going out of business. My question is, do we have a lot of account to do from these uh, conservation districts that no longer exist? I'm, I, I, uh, I don't know if we do. Yeah, right. I, yeah, you're right, some of those conservation agencies have folded or been subsumed by others. I don't know if we, and we do have some accounts that are unpaid. I don't know if there's an overlap between conservation districts and unpaid accounts. But you're absolutely right. During the recession here, a lot of them did go under because that used to be kind of a booming business. And oh, then, yeah. then the, the interest rates changed and that was it for a lot of them. Yeah. Just curious. Okay. Thanks. Well, speaking of open space, and I'll go to the next slide here, one modification that we did do with this master plan is on the sewer side. The sewer we did get away from putting a sewer uh, uh, duty factor on open space. So we did move that one to zero there. And then otherwise here, sewer, you see, it's been very consistent here uh, with the previous master plan. Okay, so just to recap here, uh, if you remember back in a, a September of 2016 when I made the original presentation, I had a, I had a comparison here. Uh, so I took a couple slides from that, and one of them is uh, on some mixed use here. So basically I took three examples of mixed use uh, that we had in our system uh, just to kind of feel out how close are our duty factors to what's actually out there, what we're actually metering. And you can see on the mixed use here, uh, 
it, it's kind of all over the board as far as actual demand on both the residential and the commercial side for these mixed use developments. But when you kind of average and total them all up, we're not too far from our actual duty factors. So a duty factor for residential is 200 gallons per day per dwelling unit for residential. And just taking these three examples, we get an average of 186. So we're well in the ballpark there. And then even on the commercial side there, it's a little bit lower. It's about 1250 instead of 1500. But still, we're, we're getting in the ballpark. And then on the hotel side here on the bottom, we took three hotels. And I think at the time, there were only three hotels in the district. Uh, and when you averaged all that together, you had about 121 gallons per day per room, real close to our duty factor of 125 gallons per day per room. Okay, so now I'll kind of get into the demand projections here. Okay, so basically we take our duty factors and we take our approved land uses here from our jurisdictional agencies and we combine these together to come up with our demand projections. And we can do this here for every single parcel within the district. We can actually assign land use to it and put a demand projection to it. We then total all those demands from all the different parcels here and this is representing the ultimate water and wastewater demands uh, for the district. And then we use the SANDEG population estimates to basically estimate from here to 2035 in five-year increments. So phase one is basically going up to 2020. Phase two is going to 2025. Phase three, 2030. Phase four to 2035. And then phase five is ultimate here, so everything beyond uh, 2036. <clears throat> and you can see the population here and what SANDAG has projected uh, all the way up to 2036 here, which is about 122,000 people here in 2036. <coughs> can you go back to that real quick? Yes, sir. So, current population is 95, 96? No, current, current population is about 100 and, it's about 103,000, yeah. 130? 103. 103,000. 103. It's bigger than the city, bigger than the city. Yeah. Okay, city is, okay, big, okay, I got you. Okay. Yeah. And so, for the district, by 2020, which is right around the corner, you're predicting projecting uh, 106,000. Correct. For the entire district, above and beyond just the city of San Marcos. Uh, yeah, that, that includes everything here, county, gotcha. everything. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then this is just a historical look at all of our master plans here, going all the way back to 1975. So that middle column is basically the demand at the time of the master plan. Uh, you can see here, the 2008 master plan, we peaked in our water demand. It was over 18 million gallons a day back then. Uh, conservation has done well uh, during that drought to cut it down. Uh, we're, we're using tw uh, 15 and a half million gallons a day for this master plan. Current demands are actually a little bit lower than that, uh, but as you've probably seen from a lot of newspaper articles lately, that demand is starting to creep back up uh, from those uh, 2013 concert or 2015 conservation days. And then the column on the right here is your projected ultimate demand for each of those master plans. And so the general trend here is even with the uh, additional densification, the specific planning areas, uh, especially that were approved by the city that actually added more demands, we're actually estimating the ultimate demand to be less here, mainly due to these conservation efforts here uh, by our rate payers. And then on the wastewater side, uh, going back to the 1986, which I believe was the first master plan that we had that included wastewater, you can see it was uh, about half of what it is today. Uh, but the takeaway from this is the column on the right. We basically started assuming we'll have 14.4 million gallons a day at Ultimate. We're right back to 14.4 million gallons per day at Ultimate. More people, but a little less usage here just because of internal conservation efforts, indoor conservation efforts. Okay, so now we'll go into the design criteria real quick. So water and wastewater, we have specific design criteria. 
I'm going to try not to bore you too much with the details here, but I did want to point out here what we, this is one of the things we did want to specifically talk about with the BIA. And we're aiming here, when we do design criteria, not, we're, we're not looking at average usage here. We're looking at the peak usage here. We're looking at the max day. We're looking at the, the peak hour usage here. That's what we size our infrastructure for, to meet those peak demand times. And the same thing on the wastewater side here. Again, we're, we're, not, we're not designing a sewer for, for an average day. We're, we're, we're designing a sewer for this ultimate peak wet weather where you know, you've got a huge rainstorm and then you've got to move all that sewer plus the uh, inflow and infiltration or else you're going to have it spilling out to the streets. And that was my question. If we didn't design for the peak, then it would spill into the street. Correct. Uh, yeah. And the water, the well, sewer is in the street. What about the water? If we don't design for the peak, what happens when we have a peak need? Sure. So if you design it for your average usage, then, you know, you, you, your average usage would be for a pipeline about yeah. this, this size mm -hmm. here. Right. And then so come your peak period, you'd have a ton of head loss to that system. You would lose a ton of pressure through your system. So you can have a lot of people that barely get water and a lot of people that don't get water because you've lost all your pressure when you try to move that quantity of water through your pipelines. Yeah. Okay. Uh -huh. James? Let me just add one more thing to the presentation. One of the most interesting things we found was even with the average use being down, our peak didn't change. So in other words, when people get up and take their showers, they're still using as much water as they did before. So from our designing the pipeline and the street design the sewer line, the peaks didn't change. It didn't affect the capital projects. But the averages changed because the average gallon per day uses went down. So were that affected our capital projects? It took effect, but were the peaks didn't change at all. So for the sizing our pipeline, sizing our pump stations, it really didn't make a, a, a impactful difference. And just to kind of point it back on uh he just said here so if your average de demand decreases well if your peak increases here so when you factor that in you don't really have a difference there when it comes to your peak usage so that that so the earthquake that hits at 3 a.m at 3 15 you're not getting a big peak usage of your sewer oh yeah you probably are when you have people wake up Right, but this is taken over. This is taken over a yearly basis, for instance. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have our design criteria, and then we we plug that in along with our uh, demand here into our water and wastewater models. So these models were created uh, using our GIS infrastructure here. So it's on a parcel level loading. Each parcel has its assigned meter, has its assigned sewer. And we basically take the demands at the point of the actual demand here, which is every residence, every commercial building, et cetera. Uh, we can run time step scenarios for existing demands. We can run them for ultimate demands. And for each of those there, we can run average days. We can run peak usage, max demands, you name it. So uh, just so that I'm clear, <clears throat> with our information, we can gather how much, how many gallons is being used at any some time during the day or week or whatever, and we know what the peaks are, and so then we put that into the equation. So we know how big that pipe needs to be, regardless of where it is in the system. It's way up in Twin Oaks, it's small. If it's down here in the valley, it's added more usage, so it's bigger. Correct. So we, we put in the diurnal curve, which is basically the typical usage pattern throughout the day that's used for a residence, commercial, you know, mm -hmm. they're all a little bit different there. Mm -hmm. And then we can actually put that into a model, do an analysis on there to say, this is your peak time here when you're going to be seeing the most wastewater go through your pipe, for instance, or your biggest water demand. And what is that curve called again? A diurnal curve here. Is that an algorithm? It, 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 no, it, it, 
Yeah. Yeah. D I U R N A L. Diurnal. U R N A L. Yeah. And that basically tells you your usage here over a 24 hour period. Mm -hmm. Yes, first. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Rob, I was wondering on using this model, are you using the actual operational SCADA data to validate these models? Yes, yes. We do a lot of validation here. We do a lot of calibration with the operations departments on these. Yeah, and I think just about every water agency does that. Thanks. And my question was, since you do this on every parcel, so you could take the parcel I live on and you could tell me what you have expecting my water and sewer demands, and then you could also do it for an average day maximum, all that based on just one parcel, and then you put them all together, or am I, yeah? We put them all together, uh, but we take, so for instance, there's assumptions made on like your type of residence, for instance, mm -hmm. depending on its density. You know, if you're living on uh, a two acre parcel, for instance, you're gonna have, you know, let's say 250 gallons per day of sewer and about, you know, 500 gallons per day of water, for instance, here. That goes into the system, and then it goes in for all the different parcels for all the different land uses here. Okay. And then, yeah, we put in your, your, the peaking information based on, based on these curves here. Mm -hmm. And that's how the model was run. You do have a lot of calibration. Y yeah, yeah, so it's not like, for instance, we take your parcel and say, all right, your peak is this, and then oh, theirs geez. is this. It, it's, it's not. No, it's a, we're all yeah. in the plot together, and then we're coming up with the uh, cor correct. Main yeah, yeah, it's not quite that sophisticated here because we don't we don't take everyone's actual meter usage there, for instance, when we're projecting demands. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of what the model will spit out here. So what you're looking at here is uh, this is our sewer model, and this just happens to be uh, right in Rock Springs here. Uh, just to the east of uh, Woodland Drive. And what you're seeing in red is a deficient pipeline. And so when we did our 2008 master plan, this is what the model identified here when we were setting up that master plan. And what happened here was, okay, this pipe will be deficient during peak flows. We need to upsize that pipe. And so what you're gonna see here <clears throat> in the next uh, month or so is Mr. Hubbard's gonna come up and uh, he's going to ask for money here uh, for a project. <laughs> Stay down. Save it. Tell him no. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, just to recap here, design criteria are put into the models here. The models can inform us when those design criteria are exceeded, like you just saw on the previous slide. And so what happens then is user makes changes to the model. They either upsize the pipe here, they got to put in a little more pumping capacity there, et cetera. Each of these changes equals a capital improvement project. And that's how we come up with our programs. And before we move on, <clears throat> do we know how deficient those red lines are? I mean, is it 15, 20, 50, 100% deficient? That we then know we got to do this tomorrow as opposed to, well, you can do this next year. Yes, sir, because we can run this at different time steps. We can run it under existing demands, 10 years from now, ultimate. Yeah, so we know when it's projected to go deficient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. So then it's set up to read that it's going to be deficient, but it doesn't tell you exactly when. You have to look at it and determine that separately. This just red flags an item when you do that? Or have you red flagged it? No, no, no. So let me go back to that one here. So let's say, for instance, in, and this was a, a, a 2015 condition, I believe, when it was run. So we run the model under projected 2015 demands. And this is back in the 2008 master plan. And the model will spit this out, a, okay. a red pipeline here. Like, OK, this is a problem here. Now we need to work on trying to fix this here. And so that's when we start <clears throat> upgrading the pipe size, making that larger. And we get to a point, okay, everything goes green again here. After you've upsized it enough here, like, okay, that's what we need to do to alleviate this issue. Okay. Curiosity's sake, and this isn't going to happen, but curiosity's sake, 
the red line, I think Director Hernandez asked, it doesn't tell you when, it just tells you it's deficient for 2020? So it doesn't tell you what happened in 17, 18, 19? No, 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 no. This is done on a five year increment there. So it might be good in 2010, come 2015, okay, it's starting to exceed a certain design criteria. We need to start taking a look at it. Okay, so it could be as far out as 2015? This could be as far out as ultimate. Oh. Yes. It could be great all the way through 2035, and then we run the ultimate model, and then, okay, you've got a red here. And that's just because demands are projected to increase that much between 2035 and ultimates. Well, should this end in So, for instance, just using the, the Rock Springs project, that's the next large project that we're looking at doing. But we don't know when it would fail exactly. We just know it's going to fail. Yeah, well, it's not a failure. This is a capacity issue. So, in other words, the pipe okay. is full during those diurnal peaks already, is what Rock's saying. In 2015, we knew that every day that pipe is over the design criteria, was full, and our operations have already flagged that pipe on. They already knew about it as a potential spill site that we have to keep an eye on in other ways. Okay, so it's already full. In this case, that pipe is already at a design criteria capacity. Yeah, let, let's differentiate between full and design criteria, because a, a pipe you. shouldn't yeah. be more than half full. Okay. That's the design criteria. If it gets over that, then it's time to replace it. It's that not full, full. Okay, I was gonna say, if you already determined it's full, we should be having leaks already. That's, that's why I try to use the for the term, it's exceeding our design criteria, which is a half full pipe in this case because it's an eight inch pipe. Mm -hmm. And all of our sewer pipes should be at half or less? It depends. Until you get into the big pipes. Yeah. Three 15 inch and larger, you can get up to three quarters. That's your design criteria. Oh, okay. Thank yeah. you very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Director Evans. It's a little bit of clarification on that for me. So you run uh, the model for the 20, um, the first one, the 106, and you've got this pipe showed up that it's beyond the design criteria. So we know we have a time period that it needs to be looked at and it's one of the first things. So I'm assuming then that as a district, O&M and everyone is watching that all the time and you're moving it on the budget if it needs to be done before we have a big problem. Yes. It, whenever possible. That, that's that's absolutely correct here. And um, this is so this is so the part of this is not only do you identify, but you can prioritize when that's why you're going to prioritize when the CIPs happen. Always yes. knowing that every day O and M could find a surprise. Now what I want to know is, so we've done this, and let's say next just December we fix that pipe. So who inputs into the next the model that is done? Is it done then? Does someone go into the model and? show it's now green between now and the end, when, end of the term 20 whatever it was and and the second question of that is <clears throat> or do you have to wait till the five years for the next one to show it was that oh no staff is perfectly capable of when the project's built there we can go in and we can just modify the model to show okay all this is operating now so mm -hmm. if you fix this today you could you would That'd be nice. If um, you would could show this to me tomorrow and it would all be green. Assuming Correct. you'd done the input. Absolutely, yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So then when you get to the um, the next session, the next um, phase, right. you can run the model then. But that's 
basically showing us things that we believe we have until the end of the first phase to begin working on them because they weren't read in the first phase. But in the second phase, let's say we have five more pipes. So O&M or whoever, all you engineers, you know then that by looking ahead that approximately five years down the road, you're gonna be looking for those, we're gonna be on those. And then the next five, so you can see how it can grow and grow and stretch. Right. Okay, okay, and then do you have the capability, let's say we're guessing this growth, if the growth suddenly happened in one area more than another or sooner than expected, can this also reflect to you if that moves a project up or back? So that, that's a great point there. So in this very latter situation, let's say we have a development that comes in and it explodes growth in one sector of our district. Uh, what we do for that development is we require them to perform a water and sewer study that will evaluate not only their development, but also their impact on the surrounding area here. Okay. We're, the run, we're the ones that, that perform that analysis. So yes, the answer is we can definitely have a feel for when a big development comes in and explodes the usages here. We can make modifications <coughs> on the fly. Mm -hmm. and, and a good point, too, about uh, just the use of operational staff here is if you're asking about calibrations, that's probably the best one of all right there. You get operation staff involved and they say, yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Yeah, that's a problem. Mm -hmm. Yes? Well, while you have that map up, mostly out of curiosity, is uh, Twin Oaks, I assume, where I see the uh, double uh, pipeline coming down from north? That, that's that's going to be Woodland. That's Woodland Parkway? That's, that's Woodland Parkway. Uh, okay, uh -huh. Woodland Parkway. Now, let me ask a question. You have, I'm assuming this too, because Emerald Heights came in later, and that's where it goes. Well, when it gets to the southern part there, it seems to just stop. Would there be a place it's going to from there? Yeah, oh yeah, absolutely. So um, that intersection of Woodland and Rock Spring, uh, the sewer pipe turns into a 15-inch collector that actually goes oh. west uh, down Rock Springs, and it, it'll go down Richland Road, and then through uh, our inverted siphon, which is another project you're gonna have here from our capital facilities staff here in the near future, uh, because that one is uh, getting aged there and starting to disintegrate a little bit. Is that the one near Hollandia Dairy? That's the one that goes right through the Diamond Environmental Parking Lot. Oh! Crosses underneath San Marcos Creek it's well and, used. and the, uh, the tracks, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, right, James. And I just kind of show you how this all ties board sees the budget and the capital sheets, you see future projects or projects that have expenditures in later years. Those are the ones that are going to spit out from the master plan. So you start looking at the five-year spending plan. What the master plan says is in the next phase, because already in the budget, we're, we're projecting past 2020, 2021, 2022. So those some of those future projects that I talk about or that we talk about in general, those are coming from the master plan. As they get closer, we do more analysis to see where to prioritize them. So that's kind of where we get those projects from. It's this effort, and it shows up in the budget. So this way, you can kind of see how it feeds into our budgeting process for capital. But as time goes on, your budget prior prioritization can change. Yeah, absolutely, it does. And so operations, for example, during the recession, we growth stopped, and we stopped building. And this is a good point why we update the master plan every you know five to seven years or so there because things change uh, growth patterns change etc yes directors no. so, not to get too crazy on the years but what, just out of curiosity why is this referred to in this presentation as the 2017 master plan when it's 2018 sure so uh, this <laughs> this is a this is a fun question that goes back to when we first started the process Historically, yeah, historically, uh, the master plan has always been named after what we call the cutoff date, which is, you know, we take information, for instance, for this master plan from 2008 to 2014, and then we cut it off saying we're not looking at development beyond that there. If we did, it, it's going to take 
almost two years to kind of go through the process, as you've kind of seen here since our 2016 presentation. So we've always called it by the date of that cutoff there. And then the board's like, why are we doing that? Why don't we call it the date of the adoption? So the short answer is, can this be called a 2018 master plan? Absolutely it could. Because if the board adopts it in 2018, it would make sense. So we started this in 17? So we started this process actually back in 2014 when we did the cutoff dates. Okay. Okay. Weird. <laughs> I guess okay. it's, just, it's just a date, but it's kind of it's just it's weird. I can I can see we were oh, trying to yeah, we, we were trying to um, you know communicate it to the public. They would probably look at us like hey, you guys are a little bit you know late <laughs> on your 17 plan. So yeah, that's a good point because historically uh, we average about six years between master plans, and this is no exception. We're we're still going from 2008 to 2014 here. It's still in that six-year window. We're just calling it by the date that we're adopting at this time. So it's not like that information is completely dated. It's like, no, 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 we're just using a different date for the name. Mm -hmm. So we could change it to 2018 if we chose to, if we adopted it in 2018. Absolutely. Yes. And do it that way from now on instead of. Mm -hmm. yeah. oh. Yes. I was going to, now that I really understand it, I like that it says 2017 and that's the cutoff date, but maybe, and it doesn't really matter when we've approved it, I think what's really important is when did we do the cutoff, so we're looking at the information, but maybe we should call it, um, you know, master plan of 2017 cutoff, so well, it's public 20, will know. 2014 cutoff. Well, 2014 yeah. cutoff, I guess. I yeah, yeah that would, unfortunately, that would look even worse, in my opinion, because Lord Probably, have mercy. Probably, but it'd be honest. Well, sometimes. <laughs> Yeah. Don't we need to well my recommendation is the title should be when the board adopts it yeah. and inside in the cover and the explanation it'll explain exactly. when the cutoff oh, right date is for the date. Yeah. Yeah. So we don't want to miss <coughs> yeah. mm -hmm. the other work. two people that read it. Um. <laughs> Continue. I have a lot of attorneys that read this. <laughs> yeah, I know. <laughs> One in particular. <laughs> okay. Okay, uh, so Water and wastewater capital improvement programs here. So th this is this is your your synopsis, your your executive summary sheet here for the actual capital improvement program. We've got 11 water pipeline projects, 10 reservoirs, seven pump stations. On the wastewater side, 25 sewer pipelines, and one sewer lift station replacement project identified in this master plan. Uh, don't forget our parallel land outfall, and uh, we. Put wastewater treatment into this as well. What would mm -hmm. yes? Wastewater treatment as in Meadowlark? As no, as in additional uh, wastewater treatment capacity that we're going to have to look for eventually there because this master plan projects that we're not going to have enough capacity currently to meet ultimate demands. It would be at Encina. Oh, Encina. Yeah, we'd have to purchase additional treatment capacity. Are we going to be talking about the individual projects within these areas? We we definitely can't. I, I do have well, I just, some. I just wondered on the reservoir if the dock and raft are in there. Probably, probably not. <laughs> President Hernandez, I do yes. not have the dock and raft in there. I apologize. Okay, fine. Did we get him filling that link and selling the land? Director Martin, I, I did not take in, that into account. Okay. We were going to, but there was a dock and raft in the way. We wouldn't get rid of that easy enough. Takes a lake to do that. <laughs> okay, so to go through the, the water CIP portion, so the reservoirs here, uh, 10 different reservoir projects. Uh, and this kind of gives the phasing here. So we've got approximately 39 million gallons of storage here that are still on the books there to be constructed. And on the pump station, seven pump stations. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, I'm sorry, sorry. Sorry. Slow reader. And see you back to the last one. Yes. Public education. Say that again. <laughs> I, I can definitely go through these a, a, a lot uh, a lot lengthier. You, you said no 39 problem. million gallons? 39 million gallons about. So 38.9 mg, I think it's the number. Additional gallons of storage that you would need be between now and phase five. That's what these 10 projects constitute. Oh. Yep. An additional. Correct. Director Lipstock has the question. 
Yeah, yes, sir. I have a question, Rob. Um, how has the change in Edison's on peak period affected the design, the designing of facilities? Great question. Uh, so <laughs> on the pump stations, and I'll get to that there um, <laughs> right now. <laughs> has it made them have to be bigger generally? Yes, in general here, and then obviously San Diego Gas, Gas and Electric continues to make modifications to the rate structures here. So it's, it's constantly a moving target too. We have the answer one day, and now with this new rate structure they have in, it, it doesn't necessarily fit. Right. Yeah, we, we obviously like to pump water at the cheapest electricity times, and those windows are getting smaller and smaller, so you're right, well, pipelines and pump stations maybe need to be up. Yeah, and they're also shifting throughout the time yes. of the day, so it may be more mm -hmm. coincident with highest water demand. Yeah. So what, how we're sizing the pump station infrastructure here is to avoid those on-peak windows. Right. So that we're getting away from this, uh, you know, co coincident demand charges here as much as possible. Right. But, there. I mean, you've always done that. It's just that the, the on-peak period has shifted from noon to five to four to nine. So yeah. it's, just, it's just shorter, so it means your firm pump, pumping capacity won't be greater. They fill in that but, but my, and it my, shifted. It, it, yeah, Shorter my point is, is that it shifted, and that may shift into the, the higher peak use time where you don't want to be pumping still. That, that's okay because we've got the reservoirs there, so. So has it made the reservoirs have to be bigger? N no, uh, it's just all this is is we're running the pumps okay. at different times of the day, and then during those peak usage times, we feed off the reservoirs, so we're not doing the pump. So we're just moving the we're just moving the, the the pump station time windows when they're pumping basically so to it, stay off. It, it hasn't had any other effect. It has yes, yeah. and one one example here is SDG&E has gotten rid of their PAT rates, uh, which really helps because uh, it allows us to go all the way through semi peak without this uh, uh, additional capacity or coincidence charge. They've gotten away from that now, so. Everything here kind of goes into semi peak, and we still have to pay a portion of that right. charge. Mm -hmm. The positions yes. have gotten a little bit bigger, also. I think that's what you're going to And is it, is it because the yeah, on peak period has shortened? Sure. It's not because of the, the shift. The, the shift is what we're doing, but the pump station itself to meet the semi peak and off peak window to pump the same amount of gallons per minute, right. that you have to pump more gallons per minute. Okay. Dr. Martin? I so was that, did, were you saying it had to be bigger pumps then? Is that what? Yeah, bigger, but it was, it was, big, A little bit bigger pumps to, to pump as much in a small, shorter period of time. Right, right. Is that, okay. Uh, yeah, it was kind of a two-part question. I was wondering if the shift in the time of, in the part of the day has also had an effect. It, it's that part, not so much there, uh, but like James says, it's gotten a little bit bigger just because of the window. Shortening the window. Short yeah, window. the expanse of the window, exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, in 2008, uh, both the 10 reservoirs of the eight pump stations were called out 10 years ago, uh, according to your asterisk here. Yes. Also included the 2008 master plan. Yes. Was it just included as not necessary for five or 10 years, and that's why we haven't done any of them? Uh, well, some of them, uh, they've been able to defer. Some of them we built, and some of them are, are still in the phases that they were back in the 2008 master plan. The ones you built, which ones were they, and why are they still on the list then? Oh, well, they're not there. So, for instance, uh, we built the... Oh, uh, there were more than this. Th that's correct there. Like the Wolf Tank, for instance, that was in the, the 2008 master plan. That's built, so that's no longer on the list. That's an example. And we're building all of these as large as we possibly can, or just in order to hit the... 2035 build out or the 2020? We're trying to hit the ultimate build out there so that, now I'm going to clarify that statement there. Pipelines, that's what we attempt to do. We try to get this in one shot. Uh, reservoirs, you'll see in here, like Metal Arc, take, take that for instance. Do you have a Metal Arc Tank 3? And yeah. then about halfway down the list, you'll have a Metal Arc Tank 4. Reservoirs, it makes sense to break these up into. Uh, possibly two reservoirs at certain locations. So in that case, 
we'll have a tank that's sized for the next 15 years, and then we'll have a tank that's sized for after that, for instance. Okay. But when we can, uh, we try to hit it for ultimates. And that's done just because of the cost to put in the, the two large tanks at the same time? It, it, correct. There. It just makes sense to just get everything in at once if you can. That way he knows the CIP would be approved with these huge tanks. Plus the water quality, if you have too much water storage, uh, the water will be dying. You have to turn that water over. So you don't want to go through the storage too quickly. Right. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, are we uh, store a million a gallons point. now? Uh, uh, no, total. 121 million in our system. 121 million now is stored. Yes. And would you say, are we at peak capacity? Most, we get done pumping at, the, at our pump time? Uh, do we have that much in storage, actually? Uh, no, we don't typically carry that much in storage, uh, but when we have a shutdown, for instance, right. uh, the water operations department does really try to top off all the tanks. What do we typically carry in storage? It depends on the time of year. Yeah. So during the winter months, we're going to carry a lot less in our tanks during the summer months, and as James just said here, it's because of water quality. We is don't it like have a pipe, a half to three quarters full is good enough? Uh, no, no. Uh, we always keep the, the, the pipes full. The reservoirs will just keep, we'll, we'll keep the reservoirs usually around half full or a little bit less during those periods because we don't have the demand to turn them over. Okay. And then the water quality starts to go bad. During the summer months, especially when you have the fire danger, we'll, we'll increase those levels. That's a good point for bringing out, too. Good thing that uh, Ed Pedrazzi's not here. We would have been jumping up and down. And we're, uh, we're currently, we're not storing any of Poseidon's water. That's going right into the pipeline? Correct. Uh, well, within the desal water that we get, we have reservoirs that we store for our use. And that's the only way we can get that water and use it effectively. In other words, because of that, you know, people keep taking showers in the morning and coming home, and, you know, we need to flatten that valley out, and we do it with storage. So that's the only way to do it with storage, or else your pipelines would have to be so big to make, and you would, or your pump stations would have to be so big to meet that instantaneous demand. Okay. So we, we kind of mellow out those peaks or fill in the valleys, however you want to refer to it, with storage. So some of the desal that we have pumped up to us, we're repumping up to our tanks to fill in the valleys and the gaps. By gravity, the pressure that we get it to goes right to our uh, 920 zone, which mm -hmm. is zone that's, you know, along the valley on the kind of the eastern okay. side. Okay. So it's all done by gravity. It's all done right. by gravity. Awesome. Regularly, we don't pump these out unless we have a need. Yeah. Right. Excellent. Thank you. Mm hmm Okay. Has everyone got their fill of this uh -huh. slide here? <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. And so the pump stations here, so those are the seven pump stations. And then these are the pipeline projects in the master plan as well. So I believe the number was 11 on that. Uh, so this constitutes uh, what's the total? Uh, almost 56,000 linear feet of pipeline replacement still to go here in the master plan. And that's the water side. It, just to clarify, these are only projects that are identified in the master plan. There's going to be times where you see projects in the CIP that are, are replacement projects or condition related. So you may see projects and you say, hey, I didn't see that on the master plan list. That's because they're they're identified from a different perspective. Yeah, but great, great point there. Yeah. The CIP list continues forever. Right. I mean, yep. every year you're gonna be adding them. I mean, right. So never ending effect. So to clarify, you're not including replacement? Yeah, there's only growth. These are only growth related projects. Yeah, master plan is addressing expansion here. Now, some of these projects may have replacement components of them. For instance, I'm taking an eight inch pipeline and I'm putting in a 12 inch pipeline in, in its place there because that's what I need to size it for because of the demands. So is there a, a separate planning document that addresses uh, periodic replacement? We're actually- About Asset management? Yeah, we're actually working on that now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's what we discussed at the uh, engineering committee about the asset management. Yes. So this is this it, we're talking strictly uh, projects related to growth. Growth is going to be a result of new development, mm -hmm. 
at least in some cases, if not most cases. Usually, uh, my understanding is new development pays for their uh, their infrastructure around their projects. Um, would that be included in what the developer may may actually provide as part of their project, or is this above and beyond that? So. Basically, everything that's within the developer's footprint, like their project areas, is typically not included in here. But if they impact something regionally, a couple ways of doing it, there's the, the capital facility fee, uh, which the master plan is the basis of. There's also some projects in here, and you're, I'll, I can point some out on the wastewater side, where we wouldn't build these things if it wasn't for specific developments going in. Therefore, the total cost for those are assigned to those developments. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, let me ask a question. Wouldn't all new development uh, have a, a CFF fee attached to it? Because eventually that development is causing the generation of something else to have to happen to be enlarged. Yes, yeah, so every development that comes in there and however many, you know, water EDUs and sewer EDUs they need, that they, they all come with a capital facility fee. Okay, mm -hmm. well, that makes sense. That's yeah. The city does. Right. Yeah. Okay, so these are just some maps here, and I'll kind of go through these real quick unless, unless you want me to stop, uh, that just show the different, uh, different CIPs and where they're kind of located. So these are in our southern end of our district here, like the San Alejo, Old Creek Ranch areas here and then moving to the central portion of our district. Can you go back to that last slide? Yes. Is, uh, so met, so metal art, the metal art tank one, or reservoir number one, is gonna be demolished at some point. Correct. And this board is gonna replace it? Because it's not, that, that area is pretty built out. Um, that's on top of that bill, that's open space. Yeah, okay. But, but the, an the answer but is yes. Uh, above Mount Mar Reservoir? Uh, no, uh, off Rancho Santa Road, yeah. north of our tree. <coughs> okay, so kind of above, so then above, um, so like Lake San Marcos? Red Wing. Red Wing, yeah. that area. Well, that's, that area is still pretty built out, though. Not on the... That's all east side. Space. Yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, so... Number, number three is going to be coming up here in the next few years, and then number four, uh, ultimately, yes, you could get potentially a lot more densified uh, development in that area. Thus, the master plan's identified additional reservoir. And if the demand's not there, it doesn't get built. Okay. Yeah. Well, yes, for instance, phase five, Twin Oaks Road from Craven to South Lake. That's already been paid to us or is being paid to us through CFF fees. Is that developer direct related? Well, yes, all of these are going to, to have developer, they'll all be related to development, absolutely. Right, so they're paying fees in order to be paying for those future, mm -hmm. future necessities that they're causing. Correct. Right. And it's it's taken, and as you know here, it, it's taken as a like a postage stamp approach. Everyone in the district will pay the, the same fee. Right. It doesn't matter where you're at in the district. Right. They all pay the same fee. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, the central area here, what they're looking at. And again, stop me if you've got any questions here. And then our northern area. A little bit off of the topic, but maybe someone can tell me from finance. So, the CFF fees, when they are collected, what place do they go in to the finance department as a holding cell for them? We don't just throw them in there and say, well, it's a grab bag. Uh, it's got to be released with the CFF fees. We didn't invite the finance guys. <laughs> well, somebody knows. Yeah, it's a separate account. The capital facility fees are in a separate account. Separate one, for, account. one for water, one for wastewater. Right. So a lot of times, like when someone comes from <clears throat> that department and asks for money, we know it's coming from that separate account. Yes. 
yeah, depending on the yeah, type of the project. Right, depending mm -hmm. on the type of project. Right. right. It's right. coming from a separate account. Yeah. Which is kept separate from everything else. Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, they call it enterprise funds, for instance, or expansion right. funds. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, and then to go through the wastewater side here, you can see every one of the wastewater CAPs, these are all pipelines except for one, and that's the Montiel lift station, uh, which is a small lift station on the eastern side of our district. Uh, we've got almost 70,000 feet of wastewater pipelines identified in this master plan. And this is kind of how they look. So this is our southern area. But I notice if you go, I'm sorry. Yeah. I notice if you go back, most of those are doing phase two, three, four, and five. I don't see anything doing phase one. So we've got, it looks like everything on the, the top left-hand side there, those are phase one projects, including Mr. Hubbard's Rock oh, Spring yeah. Sewer Project, Sewers. which gotcha. you'll see gotcha. here in the near future. And then, uh, Director Snell, I promised to identify to some of those projects uh, that could be potentially fully developer funded here. And so on the top left are some of them, like the Pico Avenue sewer, the Mission Alley pipeline are, are two examples. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, so again, the southern area. And then this is the north and central area. And it kind of identifies where the projects are at. And then the next thing here will be the, the land outfall. So <laughs> we're gonna get started, as you're gonna see in the budget here, we're, we're about ready to get started on this here. Uh, you see gravity section, what we call D, and the next slide will kind of illustrate where that's at. Uh, that's a phase one project, so we're, we're ready to move on it. Uh, it. It'll be one of the largest wastewater pipeline projects, uh, along with the interceptor, uh, that this district has done. So this is the land outfall. It's about eight miles long. It goes all the way from what we call our lift station one on San Marcos Boulevard, uh, right around where the Arby's is at. It goes all the way to the Encina Wastewater Authority. Uh, ranges in diameter from 24 inches to 48. Wow. Yeah, it, it's uh, at ultimate there, uh, that we could be looking at almost 23 million gallons a day. Cost about 44.7 million. Oh. Man. Jeez. Do I remember that doubling in the, two two more locks in the last five years? Mm, not in the last five years. It was at some point. Yeah. <coughs> Might have been longer than five years ago, but. Well, not longer than eight, because I've only been here seven and eight. <laughs> so. Are you the architect? No, but I'll, I'll be looking at this hard. I can do it in my bedroom. <laughs> Yeah. Rob, can you go back to the previous slide and show them where the phase one project is? Yeah, absolutely. So phase one. The green? Is the pink. Yeah, I hope so. Oh, the pink. Pink? This, this is actually the pipeline that, and it's, it's not the entire pipeline, it's certain sections of that pipeline here that are a bit undersized. And, oh. and we uh, share capacity in this pipeline with the city of Carlsbad also with the Buena Sam. So uh, it's gonna take some interagency correspondence. Is it, is it ours or do we, do, are we required to share? Or can we come, is, do we own this? Or is this, uh, did, was this a joint project from day one? This is, it's a joint project that we own and maintain here, but the city of Carlsbad and Buena Sanitation have capacity <coughs> purchased basically in this pipeline. And it's all, it's all identified <coughs> in an agreement. Okay, does that agreement ever expire or is it? No. Forever. Forever. Mm hmm Yep. And, and out of curiosity, what would happen, why, why would why would some places you have larger pipe than others? What, what would be the slope? Yeah, a lot of it's slope there. So when we say some, some have more capacity than others, it's not like you have a 39 that goes to a 24 that goes back to a 39. You have 39 here. 
But some of that 39 is on a hill that's going like this, and some of it's on a very, very gentle slope. Oh. So you're, when it comes to gravity flow and sewer, your slope really dictates how much flow you can get through it. That makes sense. Yeah. And then moving on to treatment here. So what we have at top here is we currently have in solids, we have 11, I'm sorry, 10.47 million gallons a day of solids treatment capacity at the Encino Water Pollution Control Facility. We have a combined 12.67 million gallons a day of liquids treatment capacity between Encina and at our metal arc plants. And as you saw earlier in the presentation, we need 14.4 ultimates. So we've got a deficit. And so if we were to get that treatment that we need uh, to satisfy ultimate demands, we're looking at about a $50 million in capacity here. And these numbers here for solids and liquids, these, are, these come out of the uh, Encina phase four and phase five expansion projects. So we've used those numbers and just brought them to current dollars. Um, question? Uh, mm -hmm. How much treatment do we currently do at Metal Art? Metal Art currently has 5 million gallons a day of liquids treatments. And so at Encina, we have 7.67 million, million gallons of uh, treatment there. Is that treated any differently than any, anyone else's treatment because it's higher consistency of solids? Well, it's a scalping plant, which means that we take, we, we take the wastewater, we take the liquids out of it there to create recycled water, and then the solids left over, what's called the brine, that gets pumped from Metal Arc to the land outfall, which then goes all the way to Encina. Right. So it doesn't take any solids out at MRF. All of the treatments eventually does get treated at Encina. Well, that's what I'm saying, it, it is the amount of solids we're producing for Encina, because we have a scalping plant that takes water away, mm -hmm. it's a different consistency, I'm assuming, than what the other uh, uh, contributors are giving to Encina. Oh, I see. So the brine itself will definitely be a lot thicker. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. But my curiosity, are we paying any more because we're delivering more solids than everyone else is because we scalp. Yes, the answer is down in Encina. If you look at the Encina reports, Viacitos is the only agency that's paying more for solids treatment than they are for their liquids treatment. Everybody else, their capacity is about the same, their solids and liquids, because they all send 100% of their wastewater there. We're the only agency that's treating some of the liquids and sending our solids to Encina. James, first. And just to clarify that further, if we treat 4 million gallons a day of liquids at Metal Arc, it's counted as four million gallons a day of solids that we're sending to Encina. So there's no penalty. So if we sent it all to Encina, it's still four million gallons a day of liquids and solids. So the, the, they actually get the metered reports from Metal Arc and the metered reports from our solids pump station and, and you know to figure out how much we're treating. So we get charged the appropriate amount. So if we treat three, we get charged for three of solids on the solid side of the okay. uh, but not the liquids because we treated the three of them. Yeah, may, maybe you can answer this, Glenn. Uh, concerning additional treatment capacity we might need in Encina, um, hasn't Vista bought excess capacity? Or don't they have excess capacity? They have surplus capacity. But are, are we are we prohibited from buying that at some discounted rate from them versus? So the revised basic agreement, which is the governing document for the uh, Encino Wastewater Authority, lays out the methodology for procuring uh, and we, treatment. We couldn't reasons. procure that at some rate that's less. Than no, I've I've had that conversation with their general manager to say, in, in in a way, almost play them off each other. If there's two agencies that both have surplus capacity, can we shop around for who's yeah. going to give us the best rate? And the, the RBA lays out the framework so that precludes that. that. Right. And it lays out the rate? Yeah, it does. It has a methodology so based on the time and the original cost of the treatment that went in. It tells you how much. 
So it's not, it may not necessarily be any cheaper to purchase capacity than to actually build additional capacity, but obviously much less disruption to the plant. Because they don't need to expand when there's surplus capacity. You just need to pay somebody for the purchase, for the capacity they've already paid. Does it seem to need to expand at some point in time, looking at the general plans of all its member agencies? Or can they handle all their member agencies to 2035? I think they have plan? some they have some need to expand on the solid side. And that solids treatment is very expensive. All right, now that we're down to good news here. <laughs> Okay, so talking about the, the cost estimates here, what, do we, what goes into the cost estimates for the master plan? These are all the different components here. So we look at everything from planning all the way through construction here, including construction management. And that's what our unit costs, as you'll see here in the next upcoming slides, are based on. So unit cost here. Uh, they're developed from a few different sources here. First of all, and probably most important, our experience here are with uh, projects. And we understand that project costs fluctuate, especially with the economy. Uh, we'll use the 2008 master plan unit cost kind of as a basis, and we'll increase them accordingly. And then uh, if all else fails here, we can also use the ENR, engineering news record, construction cost index for inflating costs. Uh, for more complex projects here, we also include a scaling factor uh, to these unit costs. So uh, I can uh, show you those there when those slides come. And those unit costs, uh, they're applied to CI project, they're applied to CIP projects. We're, we're talking about planning level estimates here, you know, trying to set a budget, for instance. So unit cost for pipelines. So for water, gravity sewer, and a force main sewer, this is what we've come up with here. So for each diameter, you've got a different cost to it here. And as I said before, these are fully loaded cost here. They go from planning all the way through construction. If I may. Yes. Um, when you have a scaling factor for these um, small, small projects, who, who designed the scaling factor with that based on? Do we use it a lot? Do we have a lot of small projects? We do have a, quite a few smaller projects here, and so the consultant does, uh, they, they use their judgment in coming up with a scaling factor. They present it to us. We will modify certain ones here just based on our experience. And what's a smaller project? Uh, let me give you some. Let me give you some size wise here. or price? Or? Well, uh, let's let's uh, actually let me throw one out here. A high point pump station. I know this is a complete developer project, but this is a very small pump station that would only feed less than 40 homes. That that's a small station here, so it would actually have a scaling factor of I think 0.6. Yeah. And then we have some very complex projects, for instance, those on the San Marcos Boulevard or, or a major road, Twin Oaks Valley, Mission. Those would get a higher scaling factor because those are more complex. They involve traffic control, other utility conflicts, permitting, uh, you know, disruptions. Okay. Yeah, they usually take a lot more money. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And then for water storage projects, uh, we use a unit cost of about $1.39 per gallon. Um, pump stations, uh, about $1,100 for each gallon per minute of capacity uh, for those new installations. And uh, if we have an existing pump station that needs complete overhaul, we apply this number here as well. If we only need to put in like new pumps at an existing pump station, we generally, it's about $150,000 per pump is our average pump station size. And then sewer lift stations, again, about $1,100 uh, for each GP. Excuse me. Yes? It's probably really obvious. I understand how we get $150,000 for a new pump, because I know what a pump is. But when you say you're going to be paying $1,100 for each gallon per minute of capacity for overhaul, does that just mean we know the capacity of the station 
And then we multiply it by the 1100? No, we, we, well, we know the capacity that we need at the pump station. Okay. And then we will multiply that number by 1100. Oh, okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. Quick question. Yes, sir. Do you see in any of your forecasts that Montiel lift station being enlarged or just maintaining the same? You're not going to be adding anyone else to it. So I know that question has been brought up in the past. And the answer is no, we're not adding anything else to it, but I don't know if that's... We are, actually. We're, we're projecting to double the capacity of that lift station from a 200-gallon-per-minute to a 400-gallon-per-minute station. Well, where are you planning that sewage to come from? That comes basically almost everything east of uh, Nordahl Street, uh, north of the 78, so kind of that block within our district. So... A couple of the projects that are coming up there that we know of here. We know some subdivisions in there. We know of a hotel that's also coming up there on uh, Montiel as well. Right, right on Montiel. So we know there's going to be some growth in that area. Level 15 is the condo that just went in there. That's correct. Which one? Yeah. Oh, cool. yeah. Yeah, this is a. Uh, this is one of the projects here that we potentially could avoid if we can get that. Uh, Seward to Escondido, which is the side project there that uh, Mr. Hubbard's been working on too. We don't know if that's going to happen or not. We are in the very preliminary design report stages of that right now, and then there's still a lot of discussions with the city of Escondido. Will they want to accept it first of all? And if they do, what kind of improvements need to be made? Are they willing to contribute? A lot of open questions still. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so when we apply these unit costs uh, to each of our projects, uh, the next set of uh, uh, sheets coming up here, slides, is this is kind of the result here. So taking our water storage reservoirs, for example, you've got your project, you've got your size, multiply that by your unit cost, multiply that by the scaling factor, that'll come up with your CIP cost. And so for storage, we're looking at about $54 million in storage projects. <laughs> Pump so, stations. But that is over, that's over, what, that's over a very long period of time. That's, that's 2036, right? That, that's, this is through ultimate. 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 This is through ultimate. 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 Forever. Yes. yes, forever. Mm-hmm. Oh, good. We can pay for it forever. <laughs> They're through eternity. Is that the line from Game of Thrones? What does eternity mean? Forever. Uh, pump station projects, there, same thing here. So about 30,000 gallons per minute total capacity we need comes out to almost $29 million. So and, and can you tell us of these CIP projects of the, uh, looks like $60 million? How much has already been put away in the CI, CFF account? Not nearly as much <laughs> is a short answer for it there because we collect, you know, we're going to be collecting these fees over a long, long period of time. Right, but we've been collecting them over a long period of time as well. And, but we've also been spinning it there, so we're, we're, we're also having, you know, we've had to borrow money there in the past for some of these projects. But all of these fees, because it's based on new construction, is being paid for from the CFF fees. Correct. Mm -hmm. Well, but sometimes there's not sufficient funds there, so we have to borrow money from the reserves to build it, and then there's a loan pay between the replacement and the reserve fund. And then we pay it back how? Through just an annual budgeting transfer. It's a line item that shows going from the replacements, or from the reserves to the replacement. Okay, but if it's coming from the CFF funds, and that's a very pointed fund that we're charging developers, mm -hmm. and suddenly you don't have enough of that fund, or you're assuming you're going to have enough in the future. Right. Yeah, the, the, problem with the, the problem with a lot of these projects is you have to build them before all the development occurs right. that's going to pay for them. They so you have to back. either borrow money from, like, issue bonds or some kind of debt, or <laughs> take a transfer from your reserves to cover the capital. So. And is that taken into account in the CFF? It is. Amount that well, we charge. It's, it's taken into account when we establish the capital facility fee. 
we, we assume that we're already in a hole. We're already kind of behind, so we have to not only make that up, but also pay for all the projects coming forward. That all gets thrown into what we call the, the numerator, how much money do we need? And then okay. we divide that by the development. But the interest that we're being charged for this is also being thrown in there. It's all in there. Yep. So the developer is paying 100% of yep. everything. Yep. Yep. Pipelines here, 56,000 feet, looking at about $29 million in water pipelines. On the wastewater projects here, this one's two slides long here. <laughs> A slide one uh, and then slide two. So that totals about 74,000 feet of pipelines here, about $50 million. And if you want the grand summary, all right, here we go. So this, this is also a comparison too to the previous 2016 presentation uh, that I made on capital facility fees, or sorry, capital facility plan. So we had, at, at the time we had $315 million in that estimate. Now we're looking at about $257 million. So it has dropped down significantly. If we do this again in a little while, we'll let you down. <laughs> Probably. Three more master plans, there won't keep, be anything keep left. Keep going, it'll be free. That, that is the idea, though. This slowly <laughs> integrates here over 100 years. It should be <laughs> down to nothing. It Three. should be, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot less. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> there will all be something to do. So as far as our CIP costs here, and this is divided out between phases here. So water in blue, wastewater in green, and then orange is your total between the two. Uh, so what you're seeing here is a lot of this, a lot of this work here, it's deferred to phase five. Yeah. Uh, a lot of the wastewater, for instance, is going to be your treatment costs, for instance. <coughs> And then a lot of the water uh, uh, reservoirs, uh, some pump stations and pipelines too, actually differ out to phase five. Yes. The question is the reason why uh, 2005 is so big, not 2005, the fifth one is so big, is because we don't have a sixth and seventh and eighth year that would show a normal amount making it's, it up. It's, it's also an infinity timeline. Right. So, whereas the other ones were only for like four, four year periods? Yeah. Five year well, that's period. what I'm saying. If we went another five years, we would drop that down. Yeah, you could break that to 2036 to 2041 yeah. and 2040. Right. Yeah, you could do and that. that right. Ultimately, it would reduce. Yeah. 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 All right. Mm -hmm. And then, again, this is a comparison between the 2016 presentation and this presentation here just on how the spinning is uh, divided between the different phases. So you see in 2016, uh, a lot more of it was front loaded, uh, especially in the what we call the phase two between 2021 and 2025. And now you see uh, with the current analysis, we're actually deferring a lot more back uh, through phase five. Into my final slide here. No, so soon? is just the, uh, the schedule. So we're currently doing the presentation on the CIP. Uh, we're getting very close to finalizing this master plan and also uh, the draft program EIR. I'll be back here within a month asking the board's permission here to circulate that document for 45 day public review. We'll have a workshop probably in late May and then hopefully uh, we're going to close the public review comment period for uh, probably sometime in June. We'll address comments and then hopefully be back before the board sometime around August there asking to uh, accept the document and then we'll see if anyone wants to challenge it. Rob, that public workshop won't be at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Oh, good point. No, it will not there. That's, that's usually a, a separate uh, a separate day than mm -hmm. a board meeting, either a Tuesday or a Thursday. Mm -hmm. right. And it does not require board member attendee there. And you'll schedule that for like 11.15 in the morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Make sure those public usually five o'clock or six o'clock is, we is what we sure schedule those for. Opportunity for public input. Yeah, yeah. We don't typically get a lot of uh, just the general public. We uh, usually have it from uh, uh, either development community or, or other uh, uh, agencies or groups there. For mm -hmm. but those, but, but those folks are typically they're used to going to council meetings and board yeah. supervisor meetings. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We we definitely try to do it in. Mm -hmm. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any additional questions the board has. Yes. You know, a slide that probably, you know, didn't get a lot of attention, one, two, three, four, I think it was five. Um, but I think it's, and it's just more of a kudos for you guys and the entire team here. But, you know, there's been a lot of talk lately about, you know, planning or maybe the lack thereof it was some uh, ent entities and um, could you maybe tell us a little bit I know you obtained you know the land use information from all of these different uh, cities as well as Sandag how else do you guys interact with these uh, the other cities that are within our boundaries um, to plan for this kind of stuff so we for the master plan uh, we'll run through their planning department, for instance, at the city of San Marcos and in the county. Uh, it's a little easier to get information on Carlsbad, Vista, and Escondido because those are very small areas that they're talking about. So we can typically get that information from their planning departments real quickly. Uh, but like the whole city of San Marcos, that, that's a bigger effort for them there. So we do correspond with them. Uh, I talk with Karen Brindley a lot when it comes time for this here and she and her staff are able to basically it's gotten easier over the years too they used to do this in a paper map process which means they marked it up okay. like manually <laughs> and now everything's through gis here which makes bringing the information over a lot easier i just think it's it's just kudos that you guys i, I love to see the collaboration that's the only way that you can really truly do this type of planning and it should you know the more the more collaboration the more discussion between the different agencies and cities uh, the better so thank you, mm -hmm. thank you. yes sir. on that note do we do we just make sense to do it but i'm not so sure we do um the cities uh, do a master plan every five years as well and they have all that current information as of whatever their date is or whatever they use as a measuring stick we use the cutoff date, who knows what they use. Considering our largest area is the city of San Marcos, shouldn't we plan our five years close to there so we get all that current information that we can use immediately? We haven't done that to date, but I definitely hear what you're saying here uh, because they, for instance, they've just done a, a recent update here. Right. So we, we take what we can from them. Uh, they'll do a general plan. There will be some modifications between that time they adopted theirs and we are ready to, for our cutoff date on ours. Right. And then, yeah, we have to manually gather that information from the city on that. Uh, can uh -huh. we do that in the future? Sure we can. I know it's difficult because most cities today have to use general plan amendments to build mm -hmm. anything. Um, so there's a lot of that that's going to continue to go on. So I just thought if you had some way of putting it close to when our agencies, or at least our largest agency, is doing it, makes them easier to say, here's our numbers. Versus, well, we did it four years ago, our fifth year is next year, but let's see what we can come up with for you. Just a thought. Yeah, and, but I know their GIS is, it, it's typically really updated now uh, with these new SPAs, for instance, that go, and they'll have a general plan, they'll have the additional information. It continues to get easier, though, to do this here, so the timing isn't as critical as it used to be. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Great job, by the way. Oh, Great yes. Job. Director Evans? It was a, a very great presentation. It was very thorough. Thank you for answering the questions and compliments to everyone involved, not only in the plan, but in all the details and um, hindsight, foresight, and learning that goes into this by staff members that always blows me away when just when I think I've got a grasp on it that I didn't realize gravity down a hill and level would make us do something with pipes. Uh, my one question in the end here is we're going to do the um, that public workshop in 
April or May or whenever it was. Probably. At this time, because we've had um, questions over the facility fees and stuff with the BIA, have we worked with them or did they get an, any extra, do we offer them an opportunity especially to be involved in it? That seemed to be an issue like five years ago. They didn't feel, I know they went to many, many things, but I just wondered if we have a special reach out. Well, that was uh, um, the major factor for having uh, the couple of meetings with them. We had one with them late last year, and then we had one with them in late February. Okay. And, and like I said, we made a presentation to them very similar to what you're seeing here, uh, where we ran through the whole process there, so that we could try to address any questions that they had ahead of time too, and to see if they wanted, if they had certain input that they wanted as part of the process. And did you discover things that, or did they, that were significant? Or? No, the very small things. We, we did find a few things and there were some modifications that were made because of that meeting here, but there was nothing groundbreaking. Well, I'm glad to hear that we also are trying to be open and, what are the words? friendlier terms than we were a while back when we had so much going on. So thank you for that. Yeah, for that. and if I could real quick there, uh, if I could thank Good. Lynn here for all the help there he's kind of given during this presentation too and answering questions. And also for James too for answering questions. And thankfully here I think we're in single digits for, for the number of times that he actually jumped out of his yeah. seat here. <laughs> yeah. 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 But that's yeah. because I think he's <clears throat> in the chair. He's strapped him down. It, just, well, to, a good just to follow up on your comment about the BIA, their biggest complaint is that they didn't get a chance to sit down with us. Previously, they didn't get a chance to sit down with staff before it came to the master planning presentation to the board. So that our commitment to them is that this year we would do that. And those are the meetings that Rob referenced. So. Well, I really appreciate that. I know we had just a slight bit of contention. Yeah. Appreciate that very much. Yes. My feedback from the BIA is they really appreciate the changes that have taken place in Vice you know, as far as being open and able to answer questions and able to have backup information as to why you're doing something mm -hmm. versus just out of the sky. So uh, congratulations to the entire staff for uh, a 180 reversal from the way it used to be. Thank you. I have one public uh, speaker notice here from uh, Mr. Eric Armstrong. Would you like to come up, sir? I'm sure all your questions have probably been answered, but. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, thank you. Good evening, uh, President Hernandez, members of the board. My name is Eric Armstrong. I'm the uh, regional director for Fusco Engineering, and I'm here tonight uh, as a, to, uh, to speak for the building industry. Uh, Mike McSweeney uh, is ill and couldn't make it, and uh, he asked me to stand in. However, I'm not. I'm, I'm just representing myself in Fusco Engineering, not the BIA. <clears throat> Um, and I would echo, though, with the, the comments you guys made, that the, the, I think the, the general feeling from the BIA and the industry is that uh, it has been a much more open process, and it's very much appreciated, the, the meetings that have been held, and, uh, um, you know, we, we know, we've been, appreciate the chance to participate in the, the process so far. <coughs> uh, the uh, question I wanted to bring up tonight, is related to the duty factor for open space. Um, and I have a question for staff to begin with, is um, agricultural land or agriculture, is that part of the uh, this open space? Um, category. The, the, so, w somebody in uh, in our group had the misunderstanding, I think, that, that it included agricultural open space. And that's why it had to be 200 gallons per acre per day because you know, it was averaged over you know, the uses, like, like Rob was saying, is uh, you know, some, there's mitigation projects and there's uh, other, uh, you know, op uh, within open space category, there's other, there is some water use po potential. Um, <clears throat> I think that our, our position is still with, with respect to uh, open space, particularly dedicated open space, that, um, the resource agencies that we work with, uh, Fish and Game uh, and so forth, um, I know it's Fish and Wildlife Service, um, but uh, they, they actually don't want any water on their open space because it attracts um, uh, 
um, Argentine ants, and, and um, uh, you know, it, it it's kind of destroys the, the the balance that you know that that uh, land has grown. You know, the natural open space, uh, um, natural. Bi I'm, I'm I'm an engineer, so I don't know the right terms, but uh, you know, the chaparral and the uh, other ha uh, habitat areas, they don't want, they, they, they developed without the water. They, they sort of, they're drought tolerant and they don't want water. I do recognize that um, there are, you know, in a development you have a, a, a band of land around it that is a fire buffer and there's a, you know, the first hundred feet or so is irrigated fire buffer and that should not be included or, or you know, a, 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 um, excluded from that uh, duty factor. And in fact, I think uh, one project I'm working on, <coughs> oh, if I look, see my time, I apologize. Uh, on one project I've worked on, the, uh, <coughs> in that band, we did not uh, count it as open space. We used a, a higher parkland uh, water demand for that, that 100 foot fire buffer. The next 100 to 150 feet is uh, just thinned, but it's not irrigated. So it's, um, uh, but I do. I would like to acknowledge that it, it is appreciated by the industry that the um, uh, there's the ability to create a separate lot and not annex that um, in, in a situation where you're annexing, and also the, the appreciate the uh, um, elimination of a sewer uh, demand factor on those open space lands. You'll never have wastewater uh, generated there. So. Um, that's the extent of our comments, I think, um, for this evening. And I do appreciate the chance to speak to you. And, and uh, again, look forward to uh, seeing the EIR. The, the BIA is going to be on top of that, I'm sure. And they'll be uh, participating in the, the public comment period of the, of the EIR. Looking forward to that. And then lastly, I just would ask if I could get a copy of the PowerPoint presentation to share with uh, Mike McSweeney, because he couldn't be here. We have one right here, sir. Can I get it like digitally it. as well? Yeah, we, we can oh. send it to you like that. <coughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That, that way I can we, uh, we, have, we have your email address. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Okay, thanks I, very much. I everyone. do have a, a question uh, relative to uh, open space and common area. Sometimes they're uh, related uh, definitions, and common areas are definitely irrigated, and, but sometimes they're called open space. Have we made those designations? Yes, President Hernandez here. So open space is definitely distinguished from common areas here. Common areas are typically, like you see in, in the middle of big block developments here, we consider that part of the high density residential or, or mixed use. Okay, very mm -hmm. good, very good. Yeah. All right. Uh, President Hernandez, to answer uh, Mr. Armstrong's question, one of the things, and we're not in this, this is really not part of the master plan uh, topic is, if you have an open space area that is not using water and you don't purchase a meter, then you are not charged in the fee score. Oh, there you so go. as far as from a calculation standpoint, what, we, what we're seeing, what our meters and the averaging is that 200. But from a practical standpoint, if you have a project that has an open space that does not require any irrigation, then you don't purchase a meter, and, if, and you know, as you are aware, if you don't purchase a meter, you don't get charged water capital facility fees. So, um, and, and that subject hasn't been broached on how we apply it with the BIA, so there may be a, a slight misunderstanding on that. Uh, the calculations on the duty factors are for land planning and uses for projecting water use demands and how our facilities need to be constructed to accommodate those demands. When the developer comes in, most of the time, he wants more water than we project because uh, of the uh, uniform plumbing code and how the fixture counts count in. However, there's times where there's open space area, which we may have projected there's water demands that, that could be possible there, but he doesn't need a meter because he's not required to. So there's no fee applied to the developer for that because we're not providing service in that space. So, so um, the 200 is really almost a, a moot point for 99% of the cases, if truly there is no irrigable space or some mitigation rehab or any type of work going on. So hopefully that helps resolve some of the confusion. Yeah. Very good. Thank you. Yes, Director Martin. It opens up a question in my mind. Not, 
uh, semi-related, I guess, is, is, is uh, only because I was with the city when this happened, a bunch of uh, land use conservatories jumped up, so they got the money from the cities to take care of this land. And once they spent the money, wherever, they were gone, the land stays vacant and empty. My, I guess my question is, is it our judgment, highest and best use? Some guy comes in and says, I want to put in a water meter and I want to take the hose and put it down uh, San Marcos Creek. Like, okay, I, I, I just, I'm just curious because I know some of these conservatories have gone completely out of business, uh, haven't paid their water bills. I just, I'm curious, I don't know the answer to it. I'm just curious as to what do you do when someone's abusing the system? Is there any, any way for us to stop? Yeah. Well, certainly, there's, there's water waste prohibitions that we have. We can take actions against them. The state of California is actually trying to ramp those up to make more things illegal to do and to further restrict people's wasteful water practices. Um, so, yeah, we, we do everything that we can. Okay. Respect. Thank you. Any other questions? With that, we're adjourned.